What do you know about ammonium? No, I'm not talking about ammonia. I'm talking about the mostly non-toxic version of it, ammonium, NH4. The toxic version is ammonia, NH3. Either way, they should be undetectable in a reef tank, right? What if I told you that your corals might grow better with just a little bit of ammonium in your water? Am I lying? Well, it's true, at least for Silophora species, but the science probably holds for Acropora and other stony corals as well. It's really a tiny bit that we're talking about here, parts per billion. And I bet that your feeding regime is already providing this level as uneaten food and fish poop breaks down in your tank. Hi guys and girls, I'm Reefman. And this time we're talking about a neat paper titled Coral Productivity is Co-Limited by Bicarbonate and Ammonium Availability. And it was published in Microorganisms in April of 2020. The article is open access, so if you're interested, it's down below. There's a link in the description. Check it out and you can find it there. In the paper, they're looking at the calcification rate of Stylophora pisolata and the symbiotic dinoflagellates that live in its tissue. And they're not just looking at those dinoflagellates in general, but looking at the rate of photosynthesis and the quantity of dinoflagellates that live in the coral's tissue. Now, as a refresher, many corals get a lot of their energy from the sunlight, like a plant, but they're not plants. They don't have chloroplasts. What they do have instead is these tiny organisms, dinoflagellates, that are just all throughout their tissue. And they come from the Symbiodinium genus, and they do have chloroplasts. But again, even those, they're not really plants, but they're also not really animals. Dinoflagellates are strange creatures, right? So almost all of our coral have millions, billions really, of these dinoflagellate cells throughout their tissue. And those dinoflagellates provide some of the energy that they get via photosynthesis back to their host coral. In the paper, the team is mostly looking at the photosynthesis of those single-celled symbiotic organisms, but they're also concerned with just the overall number of them that are found in the coral. Would maybe elevating ammonium and providing a carbon source increase the population of those dinoflagellates? Well, to find out, the team cut 264 frags from six Stylophora pistillata colonies. They fed them twice a day with freshly hatched artema. Stylophora are actually one of the genuses known to eat that live food. Check out the video above if you want to know more. Now, they suspended all of those frags on just nylon line in eight different aquariums. They maintained the frags, let them grow, acclimate, get used to it for five weeks. And then they halted all of the feeding for two weeks preceding the experiment. And that way the brine shrimp couldn't provide a source of nitrogen or ammonium on their own. Then they ran the experiment for 21 days. Now, the team tested four different variations. You have to have a control. So their control just had ambient ammonium and bicarbonate levels that was found in their source seawater. They also had a group in which they only increased ammonium, one where they only increased bicarbonate. And finally, they had a group where they increased both ammonium and bicarbonate levels. Now, we're not talking about a big amount of ammonium here. I mentioned parts per billion. They increased it only that tiny amount and total ammonium was only around 72 parts per billion in the elevated ammonium tanks. This is an increase of about four times over the control concentration, give or take a little. Now your test kits at home, they can't even detect that amount of ammonium as it's less than a tenth of one part per million. And normally one part per million is the lowest amount that your kit is going to be able to detect. For bicarbonate, they used about 366 parts per million bicarbonate, which is about three times the control concentration. So what did they find? Well, symbiodinium concentrations in the coral tissue increased within a week with only ammonium supplementation. The dinoflagellates also had more chlorophyll and carotenoids in their cells as well. This shows that the symbiodinium were doing better with elevated ammonium. They should be able to do more photosynthesis and give more of that energy back to the coral. And there were just more of them in the tissue. The coral did better. It grew about 23% more than the control frags grew in the same time period measuring just calcification. The tanks with elevated bicarbonate also improved the overall growth of the symbiodinium. Again, there was a higher density in the coral's tissue by day seven, and the dinoflagellates were just doing more photosynthesis. The corals in that group grew 34% more than the control frags did on average. The largest result was in the final group, where both ammonium and bicarbonate were increased. Symbiodinium density in the coral's tissue was 40% higher than the control group by day seven and 85% higher than the control corals by day 21. 
the total number of chlorophylls and carotenoid content was also significantly higher, leading to the corals in this group having a much higher rate of photosynthesis. In fact, it was 1.7 times higher than the control group. The corals' overall growth rate was comparable to the other groups where they elevated one or the other. So even though the dinoflagellates were doing great, the overall coral wasn't really calcifying faster than the groups that only had more ammonium or only more bicarbonate. Now this study suggests that coral, or rather its dinoflagellate algae that's living in its tissue, is co-limited by both the availability of inorganic carbon and nitrogen if you want to optimize for photosynthesis. The overall rate of photosynthesis seems to be limited mostly by nitrogen availability, while the growth and therefore the density of the, of the symbionts is limited by carbon. In the study, increasing ammonium provides an increased nitrogen source, while bicarbonate is a carbon source, of course. Now, before you go out and dose your tanks to 72 parts per billion ammonium, it's important to note that really simply just making dinoflagellates happier and denser doesn't always directly translate to a benefit for the coral that houses them. At very high density levels, those organisms can actually turn into parasites, parasites that keep nutrients for their own needs rather than feeding it back into the coral's tissue. This is really common when the coral itself is under stress or when there's a high level of nutrients in the water. In those cases, it's not uncommon for the coral to eject all of its dinoflagellates. That's called bleaching. And it seems like the dinoflagellates can kind of sense this. In order to better prepare themselves for open water life, because they can live outside the coral, they'll hoard the chemicals, just like you might hoard things if you knew you were about to lose your job or go through some hardship. Now, I thought this was a pretty neat paper. I've never heard of ammonia, or even ammonium, having a beneficial effect on life. I've always thought, you know, just like you, that coral reefs are better off with the lowest possible amount of those compounds in their water. It turns out that life isn't that simple. And even these harmful substances, think of ammonia cleaners, they can be useful in very small amounts. So thanks for watching. There's a link down below to the paper, so check it out if you want to. Don't forget to subscribe if you made it this far. Stay safe. Have a great day. I'll see you next time. Bye.